Welcome back to the Please second podcast. Today we will discuss all the about watts per kilo calculations. As many of you have asked us a lot of questions about this, this will be probably the nerdiest podcast we can do, and we will let's say also discuss how aerodynamic CDA rolling resistance affects performances also from 90s. And yeah, we will start maybe with Naichka shortly explaining his watts per kilo calculations. Yeah, what I use is the method from Jay Martin. I think he established it in the 1990s already. So yeah, but it's the most accurate formula that is available to us. And I think everybody who calculates uh, more often uses this this method. I combined it with a model we made ourselves for calculating the impact of uh, drafting. Uh, so we can uh, take off, let's say, those watts and remove them, and then we have the total value in the end. But yeah, that's the method I use, which takes into account all the all the different factors like the gradient or wind or whatever. Yes, and also the most important thing is why you are using 60 kilogram standard weight, which we call etalon, and why you are not just guessing rider's weight or yeah, why, why you're doing that. Yeah, I have made an a long article about that back in the, you can check it in my pinned on twitter but yeah basically this way it is uh, only this way it's possible to compare because different or riders of different weight have to push different watts per kilogram to achieve the same speed on the on the climbs and the reason for that is basically that uh, for a heavier rider the the bike weight is a smaller percentage of the total weight uh, so yeah, so that's why he, the heavier riders have to push actually less on the climbs, especially on shallower climbs. And the second reason for that is because the CDA doesn't increase linearly with weight, so the CDA is a bit lower for them. Yes, also or what's the what's per CDA ratio? Let's say. Also on YouTube, I put the graph where you can see how much, let's say, 80 kilogram rider must push, let's say, less watts per kilo to achieve the same speed than 60 kilogram rider. For example, on 7% gradient, it's only 0 0.32 watts per kilo. Yeah, that 80 kilogram rider needs to push yeah, very less power to achieve the same speed. Yeah, I mean, this is not a super exact graph because there are a lot of factors which can influence this number a bit, but it gives a rough idea about how much can actually be saved from different weights. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it gives a good idea, I would say. Maybe you can also estimate quickly how much Miguel Indurain needed to push less watts per kilo than Gaia Realini. Like that they are like Realini has around 40 kilograms and Indurain was close to 80 kilograms. Let's say on 7%. How much watts per kilo in the run needed to push less than Realini? Uh, let's see. Um, I'll just do it for Alp Duas because I have the okay. open here right now. Um, like it, it uh, must Alp be Duas something cooked. <laughs> Alp Duas 1995, where Indurain pushed Etalon 6.48 watts per kilogram. Yes. If we do it for his weight in the tour, which was maybe 78 kilograms. Uh, Wait a second, 78. He would have to push only 6.19 compared to 6.48 Etalon and Gaia Realini, who is maybe 45 kilogram around that. I think Little Trek said in the article when she joined it, she was 40 kilograms. Okay, then let's do 40 then. She yeah. would have to push 7.09. And what's the uh, difference between Indrain? Uh, Indurain had 6.19, so 0 0.9. Oh my god, imagine like yeah. 0 0.9 <laughs> watts per kilo <laughs> less yeah, to, to achieve the same speed on up the ways, which is a steep and a hard climb. That's why we use the yeah, Etalon weight yeah, to compare climbing performance. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it actually shows that it's kind of unfair. The, the minimum bike weight rule is actually a bit unfair for the smaller riders, let's say. Yes, but yeah, that's part of the game. Programs. They still dominate these days. Yeah. Yes, but again, uh, uh, Guillaume Martin said that his coffee this bike, uh, I think they are riding, riding with look frames, is 7.7 .7 kilograms, and that's why he wasn't using power meter to save the weight. So not all the bikes are 6.8 kilograms for climbers even these days. Or even, you know, X, I think, also had like 7.5 kilogram bike in Tour of the Alps in 2023 race for Kuls at Johannes. <laughs> yeah, I think since the... Um since the disc break era, not all the climbing bikes are 6.8 anymore. Uh, 
Yes. Thing on rims, you usually had to everyone at the lowest weight possible, probably. Yeah. Also with electronic shifting or however it's called, that adds some weight as well. But it should still be easily possible to make a 6.8 kilogram bike. So it's actually kind of crazy to see some bike manufacturers not make it possible. Yes, then maybe the next thing you can explain is about drafting, uh, why it's important, why you are using it, and yeah, how are you calculating it or, yeah. Uh, yeah, drafting is one of the most important uh, things to calculate because in the current day where the riders are climbing so fast, you know, you can save so much, uh, uh, so much uh, what's by just drafting behind other riders um yeah and the way i calculate is by uh i think it's called p drag in the formula so the drag you basically uh, in the formula the j martin formula you calculate three different um three different uh things you need to overcome i think it's friction gravity and drag resistance i think it's those three i can't remember exactly the names but yes it's correct yeah and basically uh, uh you take the drag part of that um of of the those three so you take the drag the what's there yeah needed to go overcome the drag and then you reduce that with the drafting coefficient depending on the size of the group it's not as exact science but you can do it pretty pretty decently and then you multiply that by the time spent in the draft and that's <clears throat> how you can get the watts per kilogram that are saved by drafting okay it's maybe hard to understand yes. but, yes, you know, but yeah it's it's not easy it's not, not easy to uh, explain it yes true and uh, also <laughs> How are you calculating when, when you are making uh, calculations after the races? Like you, you must watch the race and then see the rider, how much ha has he spent on in the wind and so so on. Yeah, yeah, I, I timed that. Um, of course, for the back riders or the riders that lost some minutes, you, never, you can never know it exactly. So there's always a little bit of inaccuracy involved there but for the top riders at the let's say high spots it's it's pretty accurate <clears throat> yes also then the next important metric is the <clears throat> wind how are you yeah <clears throat> doing this like where are you getting wind data or yes and how you are including it that in calculations yeah the wind data is also included in the calculations um I usually take the data from my windsock, which takes the data from I think the local the local weather stations. Sometimes they don't have the data. You can also check. Uh, I think uh, there's another website, Meteostat. But <clears throat> the advantage with my windsock is that it already calculates the exact uh, the exact direction of the wind and the impact it has on the on the segment you select because you can select a Strava segment there. So that makes it easier compared to using the raw wind data from Meteostat. <clears throat> yes. And also I think you can use it uh, from nineties data, even the wind data. <clears throat> yeah. It usually goes back quite far. Sometimes it doesn't, then you have to check some other sources, but yeah, it's, yeah, it, it goes back quite far. I can't remember exactly when. I, I tried to check also like the oldest. I remember Bar Montes, they didn't have the wind data for that <laughs> from 1950s. Um, but ni uh, 1980s, I'm not sure, but 1990s, they usually have everything. Yes, the, the Mattel's, the rolling resistance, it also is included in calculations. Yeah, we use the standard rolling resistance 0.0. .0 four zero four um sometimes if there's you know gravel involved or an especially bad road it is increased obviously or co cobblestones on part of the climb like on the cotard pass um which makes it of course a bit more difficult but you usually can fact check also with strava if you check the non non cobblestone part compared to the cobblestone part it's usually doable but yeah it, it certainly adds inaccuracies if there's it's not a perfectly paved road yes then also there's cda which is very important 
and also practically the, for every rider, I think we use the same CDA. So m maybe the watts per kilo calculations aren't showing the exact watts per kilo what what they did on the climb, <laughs> but it's maybe a, a, a speed metric, like the climbing speed, let's say. Not normal. Yeah, once again, it's it's like the a bit of the same concept as we do as why we do the etalon let's say because in the end it doesn't actually matter if they push let's say 6.5 watts per kilogram uh or 6.4 watts per kilogram if they make up the difference with a better cda so that doesn't actually matter and for me it doesn't matter what what exact numbers they push in reality for me it matters what um how the the performance level because that's what we're trying to compare here and that's why we're using a standard cda for everyone we also have a different standard cda for when they use a tt bike for example but yeah for a normal performance we have a standard cda yes so practically it doesn't matter if felix gall is pushing way more watts per kilo uh etalon mm -hmm. than the remco if remco is more aero and yeah faster on the climb with, with less watts per kilo for etalon yeah, I mean, you can calculate it if you want. I know some people do it, but for me, that's, that, that's not what I'm interested in. I, yeah. I just want to measure the performance level, and that's why we use a standard CDA. It also will be like so so complex because on every climb it's different. Like how the fuck you calculate CDA of Alberto Contor where be a performance where he's like uh, uh, standing on the bike 50% of the climb practically. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, also that, yeah, it, it's just... It's once again adds inaccuracies. Basically, yeah, like the Athlon, where you could guess the weight, you, you could guess the CEA, or you do the standard measure measure the performance level instead of the raw watts per kilogram, and that's what matters more for me, at least. Anyways, yes. Also, the important thing <laughs> in the calculations is the bike and the equipment weight, and you're using also equi different equipment weights for 90s or other era riders. Yeah. Yeah, of course, the other era said, or back in the day, they used to have more uh, heavier bikes, especially uh, in the 90s, like from 2000 on, they usually had already uh, very light bikes, because since then, the carbon bikes were used widely, and also, yeah, so I think Lance already had a sub 6.8 kilogram bike, even in some years, because uh, back then the bike weight rule didn't exist but yeah i use different bike points for the 90s of course it's always not not 100 sure the bike weight we look i look at the bikes i try to find the most accurate you can find but it's not always possible so yeah that's why i always say that the calculations from the 90s are certainly less accurate or, or could be less accurate than the modern ones Yes, I also remember in Plato the Bell article, I mentioned that Pantani's bike was aluminium, 6.96 kilograms. So it was really close to the bike, yeah, the, the weight weight limit, which didn't exist there. But it still was a really, really light bike. Yeah, it was a revolutionary bike at that time. I think he got it only for 1998 and 1997. He still had a heavier bike. But yeah, that um, aluminium was... I think it was aluminium, but it was quite revolutionary for time because nobody usually, nobody really had sub seven kilogram bikes at that time. Although it changed very fast over the next few years. Yes, and also the Lens bike, I think, was six point six kilograms <laughs> to be rumored at least. Yeah, so it was a little bit lighter. I think didn't uh, Roberto Eros set his Angliro mm -hmm. record with the, that super light bike? in 2000 i can't remember exactly about that or i haven't researched it exactly but yeah. i'm i'm very sure that they had already bikes that were basically comparable to more bikes in terms of weight in the in those years where arras set the only record which was in 2000 yes <clears throat> so probably they made the limit because it would favor more like like wealthier teams because we, we like it will be possible to use some crazy materials or like like something probably to, to make it even also lighter. i think the big aspect was just safety because yeah, also safety yeah. at that point they would just build bikes that would just break easily if they just to save a few grams 
of weight. Yeah, true, true. In cycling, <laughs> they will do stupid things to save <laughs> one gram. Uh, then also in the articles we mentioned, sometimes uh, adjusted, uh, let's say, sea level power. Yeah, so practically, if a performance is at a high altitude climb, then in, the in theory, it's harder to push watts per kilo there as, it as there is less oxygen in the air. And you also can explain how, how you are estimating that, yeah, how altitude Im impacts what's yeah, there's a new article out about that, or maybe will be in the next few days at least when this comes up, where I explain this in more detail. But basically, ASLP is a metric which adjusts for the for the altitude and duration. So we get one one number that is easy com to compare. Of course, it's doesn't. There are still more factors, but it's uh, still an evolvement from the Etalon Watts per kilogram, which you are harder to compare directly. And basically how this is calculated is that we, in the first step, we adjust for the altitude. Um, we did this with, based on a study from uh, the Perone, um and also combined with, of course, our data, we checked it and uh, it's matched quite closely to what our data suggested. There were also a few more studies, but those didn't match as well so we use this one you can maybe show the graph how the uh, available power decreases over uh, when you go to higher altitude that is of course because there's a lower oxygen oxygen concentration at those heights and based on that we calculate the sea level power which is basically the power uh, that the rider would be able to push with this performance at sea level um, which is of course higher <laughs> in all cases and for that for those sea level powers we made some new trend lines as well i don't know maybe you can show the graph for those yes yeah, so well. i also showed the graph and you where you can see the new let's say altitude uh, 10 trend lines and then the old trend lines and probably it's uh how, how much watts per kilo higher it's like 0 0.3 i think around or even more Higher. Yeah, it's zero three higher maybe, and it also the trend line is a bit different. Um, it like has less of a drop off because when we made the old trend lines, uh, we based it on real data. So, of course, you know, on average, the longer climbs will have a higher altitude. So on the old trend lines, the altitude factor was already partly partly included uh, or partly accounted for which is why those drop off a bit faster uh, than the sea level trend lines. Um, and that led also, that, that fact led also to like long climbs at low altitude were kind of overrated in the old trend lines and short effort at high altitude were underrated. And now of course with, um, with sea level, with everything being adjusted or normalized to sea level, that is not the case anymore. And yeah, that is the first step. And then based on those trend lines, um, we adjust, we normalize every performance to 60 minutes. We can do that because we obviously know the drop off of the standard trend lines. And that's how we get the 60 minutes power at sea level for, for our performance. And that is then just multiplied, multiplied by 100. And then we have the A supply value. Yes, I will show also the, all the performances, which are, let's say, above the pink trend line when adjusted for altitude. And probably it was how many performances there were? It's 26. So it might be a bit more difficult to uh, get the pink trend line there than on the normal trend lines, which makes sense because you can maybe get a easier one at low altitude let's say in the normal trend line so yeah it's a bit harder maybe there are 26 performances three of those are kind of doubles because uh yeah they're plateau the bail last 10.55 kilometers for example from pogacar so if we exclude those because obviously in full plateau the bail climb is also there we have uh 23 and there's also two time trials so we have let's say maybe 22 normal um 
think trend line performances here, and they are of course ordered from worst to best as well. So Tade Pogaccio on Plateau de Pale is number one. Yes, also this shows how impressive this Tour de France was because the first four performances are from this Tour de France in 2024. And then the next three performances are from Marco Pantani, Flumserberg in 95, then Alpe d'Huez in 97 and 95. Then the next one is Bjarne Ries in 96 on Outcome, which was considered like what the fuck performance even <laughs> by 90 standards. So it, it's crazy yeah. how well riders perform in this Tour of France. Yeah, and if we count the amount of this performance, Pantani is still at first, at least if we exclude the duplicates, and then there's already next up is Tade Pogacar uh, with three. Ulrich and Reese also have three, but yeah, Tade Pogacar is right up there. Yes, other riders which are not named Pogacar or Wingard, which still are active, I think is Adam Yates, who set the power record on Blatten into the Swiss stage, which, which was like 40 kilometers short and it was like a pure watts per kilo test, but he still did some good good numbers there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, it was the perfect conditions and maybe isn't really or doesn't really represent the actual level of him, but still, yeah, it was a very impressive performance. And I think also like even the pool on Plateau de Bale was really close to the pink trend line and uh, Almeida on Platon as well. Yeah, but it also shows that riders that didn't ride in the 90s, practically no, no one did those performances in Lance or Contador time because uh, if we exclude uh, this year, then in 21st century, only Contador on Verbier in 2009 and Basso in uh, 2006 Giro Italia, Monte Bondone did those performances. So it's really unusual yeah, for this era of riding. Yeah, you forgot uh, Santiago Perez, who actually oh, did oh, the twice in the yes. Vuelta in the time trial to Sierra Nevada and the and he got the he, and he was tested positive immediately after that, I think. Yeah, right after the right after the Vuelta. I think it was for blood bags, but I'm not exactly sure anymore. Yes, but again, it was funny because before this Vuelta to España in 2004, he had done practically nothing and then he transformed mm -hmm. into one of the greatest climbers of all time in, in one single race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he also wasn't actually that good at the start of the race. He dropped on the first mountain stages and the Cala Alto, he lost a decent amount of time to Eras, although he still finished second. But then in the third week, he just went completely crazy on... Uh, Sierra Nevada, the time trial, um, the Porto de Monachilo, Puche, Porto de Navacharada, and there were some other climbs as well where he just went crazy. And then he even won the last flat time trial, I think, <laughs> but didn't quite win the world. I think he finished second by like 20, 29 seconds or 30 seconds, something around that range. Yes, it's also this shows uh, that in time trials, riders usually don't push their best watts per kilo because there are only two time trials <laughs> above the pink train line adjusted for yeah, sea level. Yeah, but I think that's mo mo only the case if it's not a pure mountain time trial. Like in the pure mountain time trial, they usually push their best ever watts. Uh, they just don't happen that often. And there are actually a few that are very close to the to the pink trend line as well. So yeah, if it's not a pure time trial, if it's if it's not a pure mountain time trial, they usually don't push their best spots, but if it is, they almost always do. Yes, also need to talk about uh, how many watts per kilo do you think uh, Pantani needed to push in 90s than uh, riders today? If you include aerodynamic rolling resistance, bike weight, let, let's say to take a Pantani on Plateau de Bale, yeah, where he had 6.96 kilogram bike. Like how much he needed to push them Pogacar in 2024? Mm, it depends. I, don't, I can't, it's hard to estimate. I'm not an expert on the CDA yes. stuff because he obviously climbed most of it into the drops, and usually the drops are actually decently aerodynamic. Uh, I, I actually don't know about the aerodynamics. I, yeah. I actually don't know. So I can't go for that. The bike weight is obviously the same. Also for rolling resistance, I'm not an expert. We maybe decided that we would do a podcast with uh, someone who knows better about it. Maybe we can change the calculations for the 90s then. But as of now, I don't really know 
the difference for sure. Yes, yeah, so again, like we, we need to get uh, data from 90s tires, which is probably impossible because even of, if, the, if those tires are available, they are like kind of old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, like yeah. Super old. So some are in maybe in storage, but yeah, but I, I think in reality, the difference should be that big as people are making because like the most important take is is the bike weight and probably Guillaume Martin is still riding on 7.7 .7 kilogram bike <laughs> and in if, if he had that 2019 bike uh, which probably was uh, 6.8 because it was on rim brakes because I think actually if we take uh, Sky era bikes let's say Chris Froome's I think they are not that much slower because the main thing that has changed is tubeless tires with tubular tires because tubular tires have way higher rolling resistance, I think that they are light, lighter, but 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 they are let's say slow, slower on in, in theory. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think the main difference should be the bike weight, but yeah, aerodynamics of the bike have definitely changed. It definitely helps a bit, but I don't know how much exactly. There's always like some some uh some bike manufacturers always claim that the new bike saves for watts or something and i just don't believe it i just don't believe it. yes of course because uh no the bikes <laughs> actually aren't the most aerodynamics because they are cutting the tubes to make them lighter for example uh track Mado, not not track but uh, track released their new bike uh, in 2024 and they probably added uh, the aerodynamics in that way that uh, they made special bottles which makes the bike six watts faster but uh, if you remove those bottles then the bike overall is uh slower than the previous version of the same uh, model because they want to cut the weight and uh, yeah it's, it's it's really hard to achieve 6.8 kilogram bike uh, with disc brakes so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's probably at this point the bikes won't get that much faster i think if we stay at the same limit, the bike weight limit. Yeah, it's because I'd say I ride a uh, Scott foil from 2014. I think Michel Ton Scott or Green Edge Cycling I also used that same frame. And I don't fucking feel the difference if I ride some rider with, with, a, with a new bike. Okay, the, the thing is that usually they are weaker or, or more heavier on climbs. The, the the riders and that's why i don't feel but actually like when i ride, ride my bike like i don't think that i am losing to the riders because my bike is old like i really yeah like the difference isn't that big especially on climbs okay the the, the weight yeah but uh, in sky era the weight was the same or they were lighter actually yeah. Be yeah, probably later. I remember like yeah, some riders in 2022 were like so pissed off that their bikes were, were in 6.8. Okay, they, they didn't say that publicly, but they were so pissed off. So, <laughs> yeah. I remember Jay Vine rode on a aero bike and not the climbing bike, ah, which yeah. was like one kilogram bigger on the Tour of Norway performance. Yes, so. Um, we finished second behind Evan Pool. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, they are more aero, probably, but on climbs it doesn't matter that much, at least it's not the thing that, uh, let's say, ma makes the biggest difference. And also, like, how much aero you, you, you can get to save the watts, because human body is, uh, I think, 80% uh, of the drag. So, so we, the, the the skin suits and other stuff is making bigger difference than the actually yeah, frame. Yeah, the skin suits are making make a much bigger difference in the frame and that might be where the biggest differences are compared to the 90 because if you look at the jerseys they had on like Bjarne Reese on Otakam that jersey just looks funny it was way yeah. too big for him uh, uh it's like that Richie Port meme photo where the jersey ah, doesn't ah, yeah. fit him at all <laughs> Yes, also uh, they are now using helmets, and helmets are, I think, making faster. Yeah, more air, they are more aero than uh, riding with with a no helmet. Also, the aero yeah, sucks, maybe. the shoes, uh, and and so unless on. Unless you have Remco aero, ski, aero skin. Yeah, yeah, aero skin. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. 
we need to test him at Area 51, also Poichar and Jonas, <laughs> <laughs> why are they, <laughs> they are so good on, my Remco skin is faster than the fabric usually, yeah, which is not the case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is they did, at least they said that, so I uh, yes. believe them because... In, it, in his YouTube video where, where he was testing uh, the, the, the uh, suits for World Championships last year, where he also won. So it shouldn't be that that yeah, wrong. I mean that's Yeah, and he also always rides with like short short sleeves, so it must it must be right, I guess. Or at least it must think it's right, which then it probably is right, but just saying. Yes, but uh, what else also will show that I think this is this is a study made by multiple uh, sports scientists, I think like I don't like I would count eight or nine. And uh, they practically uh, made a study about cy cycling uh, pro, pro war tour cyclist powers, and uh, the drop off was kind of same uh, what what we had when we made the trend lines, because when we made yeah. trend lines, we used the uh, I think Chris Froome, Pogacar, Roglic, and other riders' performances, and to see what the drop off they had with the duration, it was really similar. I think we in the end made the. Uh, short durations more uh, overpowered yeah, made slightly higher but it was around the same level so it wasn't that far off yeah that that study also helped me a bit and or i took it into account when uh, establishing the slp trend lines especially for the shorter performances because i don't have that much data there but yeah so yeah it's a good study yeah also I think we started calculating what's with uh, the oldest method or the, the most popular method at the time, Dr. Ferrari's method, which used WAM as, as, as yeah. yeah, for calculations and yeah. I remember like uh, you sent me at some point, like in 2021, yeah. you know, before we started, you had like a spreadsheet with the, yes. like big performance calculated in a VM or with Dr. Ferrari method that I think the best one was Flumseberg then from you I can't I think yeah, it yes was, it was I'm not sure exactly. yes and yeah. th th that's how we uh, <laughs> let's say uh, heard about that performance for the first time because no one had mentioned that performance before us I think at least I haven't uh, ah, me, hi, yeah. me, hi. it was on Mia's website like as a big performance oh, oh okay okay yes but yeah it, of course like Mia's website isn't that used that more often or by that many people so it wasn't as well known or at least people weren't hyping it like on twitter saying it yeah, was great because not it was in fucking level. tour de suisse not in tour de france yeah who the fuck remembers yeah, tour de it, suisse? Wasn't, it wasn't that well known let's say so yeah i think yeah you you had like a, gra a spreadsheet with those i used the or i did a few ferrari calculations but i just gave up because at the start because there was it's just not accurate at all yeah, because use... the biggest problem is for steep gradients, <laughs> because if the gradients are steep, then the, the watts per kilo will decrease. Yeah, it was it was perfect. It was really good on 7% climbs, eight, 7 to 8%. It was kind of good. Yeah, yeah, and... that gradient was good, but it, of course, also didn't take it into account drafting, which was a big factor. Yes, also, if, if he added the drafting and wind, it would be maybe really good for that gradient, but yeah, it, it yeah. works only for, yeah, the... The regular rock climbs not irregular and yes. Yeah, it's not the greatest metric, but it it was a good starting point and I think it's probably still like a very well known very well known method. Yeah, maybe in future people will um, also make a name for your calculations to be like Do Do Dr. Nightshka's method. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not even my methods, it's the Martin method, so okay. I, I doubt it, let's say. <laughs> At least you made it better. <laughs> uh, I used it as best as possible, let's say, maybe that way. <laughs> yeah, but also it's crazy that in fucking 90s, like, James uh, yeah, Martin j just, yeah. like, made something so accurate, something so good, yeah, in 90s. Yeah, it's it's very impressive, and also, like, I don't like it wasn't mentioned for a lot of years like this method like is he even alive because he'll be a perfect guest like how the fuck he did this in 90s yeah it's crazy when i think about that yeah it's 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 very impressive 
I, I, I will just fucking send him an email if he's alive and some 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 some. <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, we have to thank him for this method. Yeah, actually. <laughs> also, With there was uh, weird... also there was also Austrian guy, Austrian I think MTB writer who built a website for uh, calculations and you used it uh, at at the start. I remember. Uh, yeah, I like, used yeah. different web uh, website for the calculations. One of them that I used for like the first few months, and then I realized that it was actually had some mistakes. We switched to something else, and now we just do it in a spreadsheet directly. But yeah, <clears throat> there are a lot of a lot of calculators actually out there online, which is surprising for such a niche yeah. niche topic. Yeah, because like you made it more popular. Okay, the like, first one that was. Amati Pirali or something like that. And Mihai also like did some kind of calculations. And then before that, like probably Dr. Ferrari was the first guy or one of the big big guys to let's say do it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Frederick Portaleo from oh, yes. the Via website as well. Yeah, I, the I don't French know exactly guys. how long they they have been doing it, but uh, maybe since nineties like or yeah, really. Nah, long, not, maybe. Okay, not not that, not that long. Okay. Maybe like late two thousands. Around that, maybe around in La that. Lance Armstrong time, hmm. maybe then. Yeah, I think the late Armstrong era, maybe not at the start, because you know Vaya still worked for Festina for a yeah, long time through, through. the Festina scandal. But I don't think he went right into the calculation right away. But yeah, he's probably the longest, longest guy who's been doing it for the longest. Yes, now I remember also how we started on Twitter, like practically. Uh... <laughs> It was 2021 October, I think, at the end of the October yeah. when the, all the races <laughs> were done. And uh, you started calculating watts and didn't know how to estimate how good performance is because the, uh, the, they can push 6.7 watts per kilo, but for 10 or 20 minutes, it's a different uh, level uh, performance because duration changes. Then I just put in those that data in Excel, I think, that made the graph, and then you posted on Twitter. And yeah, yeah, yeah I do remember it. And th th uh, then I quickly made the uh, account. It gained like immediately, like, like in, in the first month, I think it was already like three or four thousand followers. Something like that. It, it blew up quickly, quickly. Thanks to Benji Nas and also Ross Tucker, they pushed all our content at the start really hard with red red tweets and yeah. Yeah, it it was quite crazy how fast it blew up. Uh, although looking back, the calculations back then were actually not that good. Yeah. <laughs> like also, we didn't use were... the wind. I think yeah, the the wind date. No, was, no. Wasn't... Oh, yes. yeah, we didn't use the wind, and it was like a flawed method at times. Like. And I still made mistakes like that I wouldn't make nowadays. I calculated the draft different. Like it was not that good actually. Yeah. <clears> but it was a good starting point and we obviously improved. Like already at the start of two thousand twenty two I had a pretty good method. Uh or basically the same method that I use now, but just for a few mini differences. I also need to mention the Portuguese guy Luke Carvalis, who had all the fucking <laughs> all the nineties climbing yeah. times, everything. <laughs> Without him, I would, it would have taken maybe many more years to calculate all those performances because as of now we have like I think eight thousand seven hundred performances in our database, and yeah, Luca Valls he helped like me a lot. Like I remember the the way he contacted, he commented. I made some post about Portuguese cycling, or I think it was Senora de Grassa performance or something. Yes. And he just replied something about <laughs> some performance by Alacorn, some crazy obscure performance. <laughs> and then I just the end him if he has times from Portuguese climbs. And he had everything. And then I asked about Avrias, the time trial, because we were searching for that back oh, then. Oh, yeah, I wanted to know Pietro Grumos, yeah, time, <laughs> because he, he's yeah. from Latvia, yeah. Yeah, and he said immediately all the times. Yeah. And then he, he just, <laughs> it's, I think it, and, I didn't even ask. He just sent like from fifty climbs right away, all times. It was just crazy from eighties until now. He had everything, every performance timed. I don't know how he has had such a large database, but yeah, it's it was crazy and it helped a lot at the start because I wasn't that good at timing the efforts at that point. With like, I didn't realize the cuts in the performances or in the footages that easily. And also, he like. 
without him before him, I didn't use Google Maps and didn't use that accurate altitude data as well. So yeah, <laughs> he actually helped uh, a ton. <clears throat> yes, there are probably even more people which we don't remember right now, but yeah, a lot of who helped. Even like La Lanta Rouge, okay, I also need to mention him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, how long? It, when did the website start? In 2022? Uh, 22 already? February. Yeah, yeah. So it was really at the start already, like right from the start, basically, because we started only at the end of 2021. Yeah, I also remember I practically made an <laughs> article about the Pocket Shores 2021 Tour de France, uh, ah, yeah. stage eight in January, then he, or, or December, at the end of December, so also blew up like. The crazy thing is, uh, the, all the stuff we are doing is roughly bl blowing up, and g like g going viral for cycling Twitter standards. So people are kind of obsessed with it. Also now, where even this is our highest point so far. Maybe it will get higher, but it's it's yeah, harder. And also, like at some point, the people realize that the calculations are actually pretty accurate. Because in, I remember in twenty twenty two, there were still like. A lot of comments. That Tour of Norway, Remco like... Evenepoel. Oh, that that was the big one. <laughs> Tour of Norway, Remco Evenepoel. Nobody believes it was. I, I, I remember Tim Tim the Clerk replied be be below my post is because of mag magnetic fields or something like that. <laughs> why why, why they're climbing faster in Norway than other countries? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, that was like actually like, I think more people didn't believe the words than they. Than did at that point. But yes. Nowadays, with more articles explaining everything and more pros also talking about the calculations, I think most people have realized that they are pretty accurate. Also, the big thing was Volta España in the 2022, right after like two or three yeah. months after Norway. Jay Vine pushed in like insane watts, Remco pushed insane watts also. Like, yeah. It was the best best uh, race for what's what's calculation. Also, to a twenty two to twenty twenty two Tour de France because. <clears throat> oh yeah, you said Jonas. that, yeah. or I said that Jonas would destroy Pogacar on the Granon climb. Yeah. Based on what's and that's also what happened there. So yeah. Okay, and yeah, that's probably all. Thanks for listening, and we will record. I don't know what will be in the next episode. <laughs> yeah, good question. Yeah.